You're listening to Heating Up the UK, a Miami Heat UK based podcast, bringing you the best heat media guests every single week. Here's your host, Dan Healy, brought to you by at the Miami Heat UK social media network. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to episode 67 of Heating Up the UK, a Miami Heat's UK-based podcast. I am your host, Dan Healy. Before we come on to today's episode, as always, please check out our YouTube channel, Miami Heat UK TV. We are throwing everything into it this year. We've been dabbling at it. We've been promising a lot, but now we really are going to go full swing into it. So we're learning a lot. We're trying to get those subscribers up, but we've got a lot of content coming all of these uh, Heating Up the UK episodes will be going back on there. We've got our game day from the UK live pre-game streaming show going on there each and every game sh- uh, game day. Uh, plus, we have new stuff coming all the time as well. A lot of fun things coming up. Plus, you may have seen yesterday, we released our new, uh, a new announcement with our man, Oli Rahimi. Um, he's one of our contributors, if you don't know him. He is starting his own podcast up called Let's Talk Hoops. He has just recorded today his first episode with a special guest from a, a former player from the So Falls Sky Force. He interviewed him today. That's going to be on the channel uh, in the next couple of days, but uh, please subscribe to his channel as well. Um, but all of his episodes will be coming on to Miami Heat's UK TV amongst lots of other stuff. So do us a favor, get over there, hit that subscribe button. On to today's episode. And I'm delighted to welcome back the host from Locked On Heat, Mr. David Ramil. David, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm so glad to hear that you're expanding your incredible coverage and that everything is, is growing the way it should because you are absolutely well-deserving. I'm so glad to have that kind of representation for the Heat fan base over there in the UK. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, man. We are, we're, we're trying our best. We're trying our best. You know, we, we, we have a lot of fun with this account. And even though, you know, it's never about the numbers and things like that to me. It's, it, it's always good to engage and to interact. And when you see those numbers, those listens, those views, they tick up. It, you know, it's, it's a feel-good thing. So, uh, you know, we, we want to keep providing good content, and we think we do. So uh, really, really good to, uh, to have you on Heating Up the UK again. I think this is about your fourth appearance on the show, which is quite incredible. But the first time this year, David, so we're slipping a little bit. <laughs> I think we tried to do something earlier, and it fell through. But, uh, uh, you know, it's been busy. It's been it, tough. And, and look, I... I can appreciate the challenges that you guys have. I mean, I can't even identify, you know, how difficult it must be trying to stay awake on game nights and, and provide the coverage that you do. It's incredible. You guys are so committed. It's amazing. It, it, is, it is a grind, yes, when you see, especially West Coast, as we've just seen, you know, <laughs> last game out against the Suns, 2 a.m. tip-off. You know, you're tweeting yeah. at four something. You think, am I even making sense at this time in the morning? But, you know, <laughs> when we're winning, it's a lot of fun. But great to have Absolutely. you back on. Let's get right into it then, David, because that leads us on nicely because we've just come off the West Coast trip. Still one more road game to play against Atlanta, which is tonight. Um, first of a, a double header there. But the West Coast trip, you know, um, first game started all off with a bit of chaos there in San Antonio. We were getting postponed and uh, heat getting hit by lots and lots of COVID-related issues. But on the whole, David, uh, wins against the Rockets, the uh, Trailblazers and the Suns, quite impressively, uh, to follow with losses to the Warriors and the Kings. A three and two trip out west. All things considered, with all those health and safety protocols and injury issues the Heat have taken, it's come away with a winning record out west. We can't be complaining too much, can we? No, not at all. I, I think, look, Heat fans are going to complain regardless. We've seen that over the past year for sure, uh, that they're going to find fault in no matter any player or anything that happens as far as the outcome is concerned. But to me, I think a three and two trip was absolutely successful. They probably would have won in San Antonio too, given the fact that San Antonio is not as good as they've been in years past. I think that would have been a, a sheer win if the team had been healthy. And I think that's the whole thing too, is that we haven't seen how good this team could be. And so far, they're still among the top teams of the Eastern Conference with the potential to be among the very, very top. So I think the road trip itself, particularly after that Suns win, really shows how good this team can be. Yeah, and you, you make sort of a great point straight off the bat there is that this team just doesn't fit. It just, you can't be sort of anything other than impressed. It, to, to get through all that's been thrown at us this year, we are yet to see, as you say, we are yet to see this team in full health. Um, all the way across the board, you know, from Bam, from from Jimmy, right. from Ol- we haven't seen a minute of Oladipo, from Morris, you know, 
And yet we can put anybody out there on any given night. So I used this phrase, didn't he? Look, we have enough. We have enough. And yeah. apart from that Warriors game, which, you know, we fought them all the way to the finish there. I think you almost looked at that before the season started as a scheduled loss. Um, but to come away with a winning record with all that, to you know, if, for I think half of that road trip, we was literally, we, we was, it was just 10 days. It was 10 day contract guys, but they come in, mm. they made an impact. How much, how much is that all being said? Does Eric Spolscher deserve a lot of credit for, doesn't he? Because it does, just doesn't seem to matter whoever is being put on the call. And the players will obviously take the bulk of the credit here. But how much of that goes down to Spo? I think it should be a huge amount of it because I think the fact that he gets everybody prepared right away. I mean, you get a guy like Kyle Guy or anybody else who just immediately plugs in and finds their role. It's because everything is so clearly defined. Everything is really explained so well out for all of these players when they join the organization as soon as they do there's a clear identity there there's an understanding of what their role is somebody steps up okay this is what you're we supposed to do and i think it's not just Spo, and i'm sure that he would be the first to give credit to guys like malik allen uh chris quint etc those assistant coaches all do a phenomenal job as well of getting guys ready and prepared the fact that they're all former players i think really speaks very highly about how much they're able to understand what these players are going through. So I think that's a huge part of it as well. That's probably not being said as well is that all the assistant coaches are former players. And I think that's a, a big factor in Miami's favor, but yeah, absolutely right. I think Spo is coach of the year. I think that's pretty clear. I think just from an X's and O standpoint, I think it's clear, but also just the fact that he's gotten the most out of this roster. And look, there are a lot of great candidates out there. I know every team is going through COVID. I know every team is going through their own health issues and things of that sort. But when you take away that a major player like Oladipo hasn't even played a single minute, that Markeith Morris, a major part of the rotation, has been missing for 30-something games, and that Jimmy and Bam have missed over a month of time, that's incredible. I mean, this is... The, 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 they, you look at this roster and everything they have there, and then Omer Yurtsevin, their third string center, is putting up huge numbers for this group. I, I think that's just a, incredible reflection of the organization and the quality scouting they do, too. Yeah, and um, I'm glad you brought up because it's probably being uh, sort of a, a heavy favorite in our opinion to be coach of the year. And I don't think there's any bias towards that at all because when you look at the the odds, I think I tweeted it out the other day, he was about eighth or ninth down the list at about sort of 18 to one. And I thought, I, I, I even tweeted, I thought, I'm insulted by that. that that's that's incredible. I mean, they, you might be able to make an argument for, for a handful, maybe one or two, but no, I'm not having that. I mean, you, you look at what we've been dealt as you've just uh, sort of highlighted there. You, I, I could almost say you could take Jimmy out of this team, Bam out of this team, Oladipo, De, uh, Deadman, um, Morris, who we haven't seen, all these guys that have missed big, big games, some not even played at all. Yet I would have every single faith that Eric Spolster could go through a season without those and yet still make them a playoff team with these yeah. guys. You know, that just shows you the, 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 the caliber of the man. So he doesn't get enough credit. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens, but we, we come, we came, did come back to some um, sort of uh, health towards the back end of that trip um, with PJ coming back, Caleb coming back, Robinson coming back, etc., which was good. Um, but the biggest sort of, negative of that road trip was Jimmy's ankle, the injury going down against the Warriors. Um, what do we think here, David? Did, did, you know, he we feared the worst when it first happened. Then we was quite relieved when we realised it was just a sprain and Jimmy will tell you it's good straight away and he's ready to go, etc. I've been relieved that he hasn't jumped straight back in. I think there was some news that he might miss one game and be back. We haven't seen him throughout uh, since then. We won't see him tonight. Is this a concern going forward? Because it's the same ankle. Um, do you think that he should now, with some guys maybe coming back, as we've seen PJ, Caleb, uh, we think Vincent's going to be back very soon or might even be back now, um, et cetera. Do we, do we give your best player, and Jimmy Butler is our best player, do we give him some extended time and let this go? Or if he's ready and he's saying it's ready and that they're being signed off, that it's good, do we play him? <laughs> it's a tough call, right? Because you made a great point there that Jimmy is the first to say, you know what, I'm ready. I'm going to go out there anyway. So you kind of have to challenge him a little bit, which is always a difficult thing as everybody in this organization has learned to some degree. But I, I don't know that it's going to get better at this point. I, I think it's just given his age, given the mileage and everything else. And, and I've been saying this pretty consistently. I mean, having been in that locker room, the first year he came in there before the bubble started, the last time we were allowed in locker rooms and seeing Jimmy Butler when he was allegedly healthy, and watching him limp around at times, there was just, you could tell there was already a lot of mileage in that body. And I just don't know that he's ever 
going to be close to 100% uh, at, at any point in time, given the rest of his career. And so that's a, a huge concern. I don't know that a, a week is going to be enough, uh, maybe a full season. And we certainly don't want to take that risk. So knowing that, I think you're going to trot him out there as often as you possibly can, knowing full well he's likely to get injured again at some point later on this season. And you just hope for the best that he'll be healthy when it matters during the playoffs because we've seen what he can do in the playoffs. And so knowing that, especially with this roster and the potential of this roster, I think you just hope that you'll have to rest him at some point later in the year when seating is already established and everything is already clear and you know what you're going to be able to get out of him. You just shut him down late in the, in the season, regular season and then hope that he'll be at full strength during the playoffs. Yeah, that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? I think it's, it's right to say that if it, if it doesn't think it's ever going to go away, it's not like a... I suppose ankle injuries are one of those things. It's not really like a, a knee injury or a ligament injury or a back injury or something that, you know, you want to really tender and take care of. If ankle injuries are going to happen throughout... And um, yeah, I think if it's always going to be there and, you know, you, you can't sit him because what good is it going to do? Maybe towards the end of the season, as you say, when seeding has been confirmed, um, you use that opportunity to, to just rest as much as can or give him a lot of limited minutes. So, yeah, OK, we'll see what happens then. So we come on to now the final game of this long road trip, but now um, a double header against the Hawks. Um, Atlanta, obviously, a run to the finals last year. Um, I remember doing a seeding show uh, with Giancarlo Navas and Brass from, um, from um, Heat Beat. Uh, we done our seedings just before. Um, Giancarlo Navas had um, had the Hawks at the two seed. I wasn't yeah. too far off. I think I had them around four. Um, we thought that was going to be a regular season juggernaut this year, running it back. There was obviously a, a big problem to the Eastern Conference last season. Here they are sitting in 12th. That's really surprising. They've had their issues like everybody has. What's your thoughts on, on Atlanta this year? They're still a threat. They've still got lots of players. It's still very much the same team. It's just not clicking over there. No, I'm not a believer. I've never have been. Uh, I just that run to the finals. I don't want to use the term fluke because certainly it's been applied to Miami. I just didn't see that they had all the the right pieces at the right time. And we're hearing John Collins complain about his role so often now. And it's just and he you know specified it in a piece that came out I think earlier today about you know losing uh, you know exposes a lot of things that winning covers up a lot of shit as he said himself and, and maybe he's right but it's like he's griping now you know he was griping last year and you understand what that point was when he was trying to get paid he was trying to put up big numbers now he's got paid already what's the problem like what is going on there what, what is going to be enough for you to be happy and I just don't know that they're going to find it and that's this is where the problem lies I like the balance that Miami has of veterans and young players to inject a new life. You have to have that balance of chemistry throughout the roster where you have guys that are already gotten paid and they just care about one thing that's winning. They're not all on the same page. When you have young players like Atlanta does and, uh, and not uh, enough aged players that kind of balance it out, guys are still so hungry. It's that disease of more that Pat Riley already talked about. You're already playing for contract. You're playing for more points. You're playing for all-star selections. You're trying to create your legacy at 23, 24, 25. That stuff matters at 30. That stuff's in the rear of your mirror. You don't care about that anymore. It's just about winning, getting a title, getting two titles, et cetera. Like I got a guy like Kyle Lowry, who's probably a Hall of Fame level player. He comes to Miami. Yeah, he's getting paid a lot of money, but all he wants to do is win. He doesn't care about anything else. So that's why I look, you look at a team like uh, Atlanta. I'm just not a believer. I, certainly talented players. They've got some depth there if they ever get healthy, et cetera. Maybe they can click in at some point but I still think of them as somewhat fraudulent. I'm just not ready to pencil them into being an elite team, even in the Eastern Conference. So I've, I've never been a believer and I continue to be a disbeliever in what they can do. <laughs> there we go. So uh, yes, yes, words, but backed up, backed up. I, I, I honestly, I listened to you and I think difficult to disagree with really. You make some valid points. So that being said, then a double header, we've now got them three times coming up in the next six games, but a double, double, a double header once away, once at home. Um, if I offered you to split now, would you take it or do you want to take both of these? No, sweep them. I mean, I don't care. We're, <laughs> knock them all out. Punch them while they're down and keep them there. That's the heat wave, baby. I don't know. Listen, you know, I would totally attack John Collins, especially because he's already disgruntled. And I even send somebody to whisper in his ear and say, hey, whenever you're ready, come back to Miami. We'll always have a place for you here. We can teach you how to win. <laughs> we'll take we'll take a bit of John Collins, definitely. So actually, whilst we're sort of floating around... Um, you know, this uh, sort of Hawks being low this season, 12th. I don't think many people had that as a, as a uh, as an expectation at this stage. We're now halfway through. In fact, this game marks literally the halfway point for Miami. So the, the standings start to take some substance. There's some bones to them. Um, you know, it's start, starting to take shape. So in my, I've made a little few notes here. I think 
it's there or thereabouts. You know, the top four are probably what you'd expect. Philly are in there. Um, the, 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 the maybe the disappointments. Hawks, I think, is, is an obvious one down at 12th. They would have certainly been expecting a, a better challenge than that. The Knicks down at 11th. Now, I'm not overly surprised at that. They've done very well last year, but I didn't believe they would maybe do as well. I think that you would maybe think they would be better than that. But that's the other one that, on the downside, before we look at the ups, that's maybe the next one that's probably obvious that you think that's a, that's a, an underachieving season so far for New York. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, especially Julius Randle, like the recent game on Monday night, he scored just two points. Uh, and RJ Barrett wound up having an explosive night. So they pulled away with a victory. But Randall getting booed by the Madison Square Ground crowd, that's not that's not a good place to be if you're a Knicks fan. Uh, no. you know, all, their expectations were so high after a you know a pretty fraudulent uh, playoff run. Uh, and yet, you know, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I didn't see that group either and see that as overwhelming talent. I thought Randall would be better than he's been. Uh, he's been downright bad on occasions. So, um, yeah, I'm not concerned. And I'm also not surprised at, their, at where they currently are in the standings. No, I'm the same. I think that everybody expected, you know, it was a great season from last year. I don't think anybody had them sort of repeating that sort of, you know, I think it was fourth or fifth they ended up, um, you know, maybe the downsides of the playoffs, so it's sort of around the, the tail ends of that. But yeah, um, you know, Randall, as you say, if, you, if you're going to be uh, not on form, probably not the best thing to do to get people back on side is tell MSG fans to shut the F up or whatever it was. So uh, <laughs> we'll see. On the other side, on the flip side, yeah. doing very well, maybe better than expected. We've got the Hornets in seventh. I think that's not outrageous. I quite like uh, uh, Charlotte, but maybe more sort of um, surprising is Cleveland up at six. I didn't have them that Man. high. Good team. They worry me in some ways. They've had the Heat's number this year. Um, Cavs have been good. Yeah, uh, very good. Um, I, I still don't know in a matchup against Miami or any of the top teams in the East how they'll be able to ha handle their own because, again, this is where you see that where young players and inexperienced players with the first taste of the playoffs don't know exactly how to react. And that's what it comes down to. I mean, being able to make those kind of adjustments. That doesn't just fall on a somewhat unproven coach like J.B. Bickerstaff, too, where he has to be able to get them to make in-game adjustments, understand how their roles change, there's an evolution there that takes place during the postseason that young players just don't understand until they go through it. The anticipation, the excitement, they're all going to come out there in that game one, wherever it might be, whether they wind up getting home court advantage or not, they're going to, especially think about this. They go into a foreign atmosphere or, you know, an, at some, an environment there where they're going to be the, the, the away crowd there. And all of a sudden, all these young players have to deal with that sort of tension and animosity and excitement of wanting to put up big numbers in your first taste of the playoff game. That's that's not exactly a recipe for success there. So I, I like the, the Cavs team. They're energetic. They've got bigs there. I mean, a lot of talent for sure. And even the fact that Kevin Love has embraced his role coming off the bench, that's a, a huge thing for them too. So I think that's where you get that mentorship role. Maybe even the trade for Rajon Rondo might help them out to some degree, although he's not putting up, he's not going to put up the numbers that Ricky Rubio was putting up for them too. So I, I wonder whether or not they're going to lack some offensive punch off the bench now with Rubio out. Yeah, I think that, like like you said earlier, I think they've got that that nice little blend of exciting, young, fast, attacking players, um, players that are fearless, that can put up numbers, that can hurt you, with that sort of experience, that veteran experience, and a lot of length, a lot of height. Um, they bother yeah. me. I think that they, they'll cause a problem. In the series, you'd expect us to take that over seven games, yeah. but they do make me nervous. So um, it's not a first-round experience I would like if it does come down to that. Right. Um, on the other hand, the Chicago Bulls are currently sitting, as we talk, at the top. Um, again, lots of weapons, lots of things that can yeah. bother you, but the Heat, they, they, they don't scare me, David. They, uh, in, in a playoff series, they've got things that they could, they could hurt you, but I think Spo would work out, and we've got more than enough ways to handle their offensive weapons. Um, I, I don't see them being an issue in the playoffs. It could be a second round um, sort of meeting if it, things stay around what they are now, so there could be every chance that we see them uh, at some point. Um, what are your thoughts if you come up against Chicago? Do they do they frighten you or are you thinking that this is something that would we would we, take care of? I feel I feel like this is not the best answer for me or the best question for me because honestly I am such a believer in what this heat team has been uh, all season long, even when they were going through their tough spots, even just seeing how the roster is going to be able to, sh to shake out. Uh, I, I really I really like the blend of this group. I like the talent. I like the experience factor. I like the fact that you've got guys that know how to win. And so I am not necessarily concerned, even by teams like 
Oh, I would say Milwaukee is Miami's biggest threat at this I agree. point. And I, I'm sure we'll probably get to them at some point. But even Brooklyn shows that they can be beaten. Uh, obviously, they're going to have their health issues with Kyrie. And who knows what's going to happen with KD and Harden, uh, whether or not they are lost to injury too. And yes, they're top heavy in terms of talent, but the depth is not there. Their defense certainly isn't there. Uh, they were looking at Patty Mills as being the savior as far as their top offseason acquisition. He's had some big games. And he also, also had some real bad ones too. So uh you know i i look at chicago and i like what they're doing and i i'm certainly understand why that fat fan base is as hyped up as they are i mean all, you know credit to them you're winning now you've got great talent DeRozan's putting up big numbers etc i just don't know if we're going to see that version of DeRozan and these bulls teams in the playoffs and i think given that that's a huge question mark there for me uh and i don't know that you know you're gonna get out of vucevic or levine or anybody else in that roster yeah it's just they don't scare me either, Dan, to be 100% honest with you. I, I like their talent. I think they're built for regular season wins. I think they're also missing a piece maybe too before they're able to establish themselves as true elite contenders. Yeah, oh yeah, 100%. And, um, uh, you know, I, I echo what you say. I think that the, uh, anybody that's a Chicago's Porter, you know, enjoy the ride. I think you you deserve it. You know, you've gone through some tough years. Uh, I like what you're doing. You've got a fun roster. You've got a lot of weapons there that can hurt. I just think that, um, like you said, and I've been shouting it all season, everybody every team at full health I would pick Miami to be the biggest problem over a seven game series and I don't think that's up that's that's team bias I don't think that's me you know sitting with my, my heat rose tinted glasses on I genuinely believe that I think the mix is right I think it's the funniest team I've ever covered um so um I think yeah that give us that mix that blend um anybody including Milwaukee um yeah heat, heat are going to be an issue and if we just hope that everybody comes uh, into the playoffs in full health because that's what we want to see we want to see every team at full health we're, we're basketball fans we want to see everybody at their strongest to see who the champ would be so uh, let's just leave that there for the moment let's just come back to the personnel um we're at the halfway point as i said um a very very dogged season in terms of uh it, more injuries than health and safety stuff you know we've had uh, many games with, without uh, morris without bam without butler all the things that we know no all of yet at all um so let me ask you this david if we was to say in terms of your top three Heat players for the season. I put this out on a poll. Um, I included, and this might be a bit unfair now, but I put out of those four, because it could be a mix of anybody. Yeah. Um, I put four players in a poll and I said, out of these four, who would you say oh, has been our player of the season? I included Tyler Harrow, Carl Lowry, Dwayne Debman, and PJ Tucker. Now, Ooh. that might be a little bit harsh now. Um, Butler's obviously been doing very well. Caleb Martin's been doing very well. Carl Vincent, etc. Uh, Gabe Vincent, etc. Um, it was quite close in terms of Kyle and Tyler. Um, I would assume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would assume that Kyle Lowry and Tyler Harrow would maybe be in two of your three for the player of the season so far because they've been available. They've been performing at very good levels. Um, you know, Kyle's uh, marshaled us through a difficult period. I don't think our record would be anywhere near as good if Kyle wasn't on the court. Tyler has been lights out. He's been, you know, shooting career highs. He's looking a lot more confident, et cetera. So that, again, and, and available. So I'd assume, like me, you would put those two in your top three. Who would be the other yeah. guy? <laughs> that, that's a tough one. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's a clear one. Like you said, I mean, so, there are many different players that could fit in there. I, I'd have to say, I'd have to say Jimmy, just because when he gets in there, his impact is so clear and so strong uh, and so obvious. So that probably has something to do with it. But as many games as he's missed, I don't know that you can make a strong argument for him. So I don't know that there's a clear third. Uh, can you vote Eric Spolstra as your third best? I mean, because he's just the guy who's putting it all together. I don't know. That's kind of an easy way out. Let's see. Uh, wow. Caleb certainly deserves some recognition. Gabe certainly been good. Max even has had his nights. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go PJ Tucker. Yeah, maybe just uh, the availability factor for him. I think he's having his best season in a long time, maybe even his best season of his career. Offensively, he's been dynamic, which we did not expect from him. I know a lot of Bucks fans were like, oh, take him. We don't need him, et cetera. <laughs> he's been phenomenal here. He's going to be phenomenal, I think, throughout the rest of the season, defensively, what he provides. But offensively, from a mentorship and leadership perspective, he's been great. He's been doing so much, uh, creating offense for himself and others. That was a a part of his game that we did not expect to see. So I, I would have to go with PJ Tucker. And I think that's fair. I think he deserves it. And look, he's been long linked in Miami and now he's showing out here. I, I mean, I, he's a heat lifer as far as I'm concerned. I hope they find a way to re-sign him next season too. Or well, he's yeah, here that, for another that that's exactly what I was going to say. I think um, somebody said, it might have even been someone on, on heat beat that said that he is the fastest ever heat lifer. Um, yeah. And I think that, I think that's a really good way to sum it up because 
he is exactly that. I, I, I hope even at 36 years old, he's arguably playing some of the best basketball of his career. Offensively, he's been incredible. Um, but he's just he's just made for this team. He's perfect right. for this team. And, you know, we've had these debates about, um, well, I certainly haven't because I think he's a bit ludicrous, but we've had these debates right. online with, with what, what you do with Omar and do you put him at the four or put Bam at the four and leave Omar? It, it, that, that just doesn't make any sort of sense what you would lose no, with PJ's not. efficiency, does it? No, absolutely not. Look, I, I love Omer. I, yep. I, I'm happy for him and his story and his opportunity, but he's not he's not even better than Dwayne Dedman. I, I think his offensive repertoire might be a little bit more polished, but I'd rather have Dedman and his experience and his aggression and what he does out there. And I like to look, you're seven, a true seven footer who has a knack for pulling down boards. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, you certainly can't start him at this point. He's not ready for that opportunity. Talk to me next season, and I'm sure maybe I'll sing a different tune. But for now, I'd rather have P.J. Tucker there 10 times out of 10. Yeah, and, um, you know, people are getting a little bit hurt the fact that it's like, well, look at his numbers and things. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, I praise him to the, the top of the hills, Omer, for what he's done. You know, the, it, I mean, he's, he's creating almost his, I think he's created history in terms of the amount of rebounds successively, um, over 12 rebounds a game for a certain amount of games now. Um, so he has done his job incredibly, and it's another tip of the hat to Heat Culture and the development program, etc., that he can come in and do this. But right. for the people saying you can't just ignore that production and then just and then just bench him again, yes, you can because PJ yes, Tucker is too important. He he, the, the job he does, um, you know, as you just quite rightly say, you would you would you would put it straight back to where it was, which was was putting Dwayne uh, Deadman ahead. And, and Omar, look, you, you've done a great job. Everybody thinks the world of you, but back to the bench you go until you're called upon because this is the rotation. This is it. And it comes down to that, especially when we get to the playoffs. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, the the conversation I there's, didn't even get involved in because I thought it was a bit ludicrous. So, PJ Tucker. This, yeah, there's this obsession with not wanting to miss out on the next great thing or great player. It's like, oh, you've got this player with potential. Well, you know what? A lot of that time... That potential goes unrealized and it's not anything the fault of the pair of the, the the team or anything like that it's just it's just different you know or your seven could put up big numbers but he's just doing it in you know specific situations here over the course of a regular season i don't think he's going to produce that way you know it's, it's a little silly right now he's, he's he's been fine and that's great that's fine he's young he, he has time to realize that potential just not this season don't put him in there when you have title expectations for this group right now because that's a lot of pressure for a young player and i don't think he's ready for it exactly that fans fall in love with potential we always know that we do it we're guilty of it but yeah you, you can't put that in a tight a, a team that is challenging for a title and that's exactly what we're doing what we are right. doing right now pj tucker and Dwayne women are exactly right for that role right now so pj tucker is a very good choice very fair choice i think it would be you know maybe unfair to, to dismiss jimmy because the, when he's been on court he's been excellent still the production has been good he's been putting up points when he needs to he's been falling back when he doesn't need to um i'm gonna give just this very special shout out to caleb martin because i just did not see i was excited when we signed him i thought you know i, I had seen snippets of him i knew he was quite athletic um i thought we could do a job for a handful of minutes but for a guy who's on a two-way contract to to give us what he's given, I think he's one of the biggest success success stories of the league this year. So he gets um he gets my vote incredibly. Um and um right now at the moment with Jimmy still out and we think he may be out for at least another game or two. Um, what do you think with this at the moment with with Caleb being in, but more importantly, um Max Struess being in over Duncan Robinson right now? Um, I mean, is this just something we're seeing? Because Jimmy's out and Max perhaps gives you a little bit more as a replication to what Jimmy does. And when Jimmy comes back, maybe you revert back to, to Duncan starting and Max off the bench. Or do you think that this is maybe here to stay now? I, I don't think it is. I think it's temporary. I think once the, the roster is healthy, I think Duncan assumes his role back in the starting lineup. I, I think Max does create a little bit more shot creation there as far as being able to put the ball down perhaps slightly better than what Duncan can do. But I mean, you saw against the Suns, uh, I, I think like when he has the production he does as a three point shooter, that's something you can't match whether Max or anybody else. I just don't think you can replicate that. And so I think you need him out on the floor. So I, I think one, I think the move was to kind of light a fire under Duncan to some degree because he's kind of been in his head a little bit for a guy like him who who has suffered from the imposter syndrome and all that other stuff although I think that's slightly overstated uh, I think he kind of challenges you know especially with the the weight and responsibility of that contract I think he he put a lot of undue pressure on himself to live up to the terms and expectations of those con of that contract and I think he got into his head a little bit and I think 
we're starting to see him break out of that now where he realizes, you know what, now I understand that I have to be better and he's ready for it. He knows that he can be an NBA player, I think, and that's pretty clear. So I don't think Max, I think Max will start tonight against the Hawks. Uh, we're recording this on a Wednesday before the Hawks game, obviously. So I, I think he'll start tonight, but I think moving forward, Duncan will go back to the starting lineup, especially once Jimmy, especially once Bam are out there too, just because you have guys that can create shots. And it's just all about that chemistry that they have with a guy like Duncan, where he's you know, playing off them, the dribble handoffs, you know, looking in the corner, catch and shoot situations, whatever may have you. I think he's, he's better. He's a better fit for that group than, than anybody else. I completely agree. And I think that's perfectly summed up. I think that we will see uh, Duncan come back in once Jimmy's fit and Bam is fit, etc. I think that works better. And I like the energy that, that Max can bring you off the bench. But again, Max has been sensational this year. I'm very excited for what's coming for the future for him. Um, but at the moment, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm keeping it as it is because he does replicate what Jimmy gives you a little bit better. So, uh, yeah, that's that's great. One more question before we just come on to a mailbag from one of our guys. Um, Oladipo, we've not seen. Yeah. Um, he's maybe going to be due back who knows, perhaps the end of the month, maybe more like All-Star, but we'll see. You know, for whatever happens for the second half of the season, he's going to be a part of the uh, of the rotation. Um, at full strength with everybody full health, and let's say Vic comes in and he starts looking good, like he was doing when he was on, on the Heat roster. I think the game that he went down was arguably his best game. Uh, he was Without looking very doubt. sharp. Um, yeah. Let's say we get that back and you've now got a full roster full of strength. Um, does, does Oladipo become a starter for this team or does he more likely come off the bench and more maybe importantly become a closer uh that's a big question there right um i, I think he will not be a starter uh, i think obviously if there were injuries or things like that you could plug him in there as a starter and certainly his versatility and his understanding his better experience the fact that he played last year here with this group he knows what to do uh i i just i would like to have him be that kind of defensive player you can bring in. Imagine that where you have the strong defensive lineup with Jimmy and Kyle and Bam starting. And then who do you stagger? You take them out. You've got Caleb, who we've already seen can lock down opposing point guards. You've got, you know, as a great wing player, you've got Oladipo who can do the same, assuming again that he's healthy. Uh, you know, you got Deadman, who's a pretty solid defender in his own right, too. You got Max, who brings some energy, although I don't think he's a good defender. Hmm. I think he can play some good help defense. So I mean, that's, that's such a great core. It's such a, I mean, it's such a great problem to have, as Spolstra loves to say. It's like, you know, these are incredible problems where you have this kind of depth there. So I think, I think he would certainly be coming off the bench as far as the closing is concerned. I guess it depends on the situation, right? Yeah. If you're going to lean more defensively, then, yes, yeah, certainly you bring him out there. I mean, you could go with a defensive lineup of him, uh, PJ, Bam, Jimmy, and Kyle. Uh, that's, who's scoring on that group? I, I well, mean, that's absolutely yeah. Clem City. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're all switchable. They're all great. They all can all move well. They're all great at anticipating passes and stuff like that. That's that's one turnover after another facing that group. So I can't yeah. imagine any other anybody else. Like, I mean, offensively, sure, you'd want Tyler out there just because of what he can do. But defensively, man, that's a, a beautiful lineup to go against. And, and that is why I, I'm so excited about the team, because if we can keep yeah. it full health, yeah, it is completely situational, as you said. But even if it gets to the stage where – even those guys you just said, and we need to stop, and, and one of them needs to sit or has got picks up a knock, or is maybe you, you got you can bring in Morris, you can bring in Gabe. You know, if you need a, if you need a bucket, up off comes off the bench comes Tyler or Duncan, right. Max. You know, this team is going to be a problem. I'm so excited for it. We just need to stay healthy. But everybody yeah. can say that. Everybody can say that to yourself, healthy. But you know, uh, the depth is important. Maybe not so much in the playoffs. Some people will say your rotation shortens, but to know that we can go all the way down that roster and whoever comes in will, will, will be a problem at one end or the other or both yeah. excites me terrifically. So we'll see. We'll see. David, final question before I let you go. And um, this was, uh, I asked if anybody had any questions, Ollie himself, Ollie Rahimi, who I've already mentioned, go and check out. Um, Let's talk hoops. His new venture getting underway. He did come back to us. And his question was with a fully healthy roster, who would you pick as the starting shooting guard? from Tyler, Duncan, Vic, or, or Max, assuming that the other four are Kyle, Jimmy, PJ, and Bam. So the one may be variable in this team. I think those four yeah. that we said there are locked. Um, Tyler, Duncan, Vic, or Max, who do you uh, put as your starting guard going forward, maybe for the rest of this season, and then also in the playoffs? Uh, I, I, I have to keep coming back to Duncan as the yeah. obvious choice there. I just His shooting is so elite, and what he does is so... Again, difficult to replace. I know you can make a strong argument that Max has been able to do it to some degree. I just, I like the fact that 
Duncan is a much more proven player capable of shooting and getting that shot off than Max is at this point. I, I look, you can't go with either Max there. I can, you can even make an argument with Tyler, although I like his ability to create shots off the bench and then ignite the offense, provide the spark, et cetera. I just think as a starter, Duncan is a better defender too. I think he's much more aware of what his role is and how to play it. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll put the question to you. What do you think? Because to me, like, I, I, I think a lot of people see Duncan as white, as somebody who's somewhat foul prone and he doesn't seem like a good defender, but in terms of team defense, I think he's far better than any of those other options there. Well, not, with the exception of Oladipo, who just can't provide the level of yeah. shooting that Duncan can. So I think he's, he fits better with that starting lineup, not just during the regular season, but also in the playoffs. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree. And um, we sort of have already covered that. I think that it's, um, I, I'm not um, interested in putting Victor Oladipo in the starting lineup to, to start with. I think that he will be right. a useful bench player. Um, he can offer something at both ends. And if he can come back even at 75% of the Vic we all know and love, um, then he's going to be, he's going to be impactful for us, but I don't start him. Um, Tyler, exactly what you said. I know, um, if you put Tyler in a starting lineup, you will probably see the same sort of production. But as it to run that second unit to be the sick man off the bench to give us that offensive spark, even if we, you know, even if things are running fine, to have Tyler Harrow coming off the bench when you're already yeah. maybe, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten points up, you know, the team don't want to see that. I'm not interrupting Tyler Harrow off the bench at the moment. So there's an argument between um, the, the two left, which is Duncan or Max. I've liked what we've seen with Max at the moment with Jimmy out, and I keep it as that because. As I've just said, I think he replicates more of what Jimmy can give you um, uh, whilst he is out. But at full strength, um, with Bam there especially, um, I think they right. work well together with the dribble handoff, etc. So I, I'm going with Duncan um, to start with because, like you said as well, uh, defensively he can maybe handle a bit more. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, as I keep saying, I'm sounding like a broken record, but it's exciting. So to have this team, um, if we can get them full health, if we can get them rolling, um, every bit of this clicks Every bit of this clicks and going forward into the playoffs, I'm 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 excited. I'm a believer. I, I don't think they make any significant moves either. I know a lot of people we are. No, I don't think so either. I agree 100. percent Like this team is so deep. The fact that all these players have gone this incredible experience, and maybe again you can make that argument. But although I would say that Miami's had much more success than other groups have had, the fact that you've got you know, 11 guys at some point that you can bring off and plug in either to the starting lineup or coming off the bench and they understand exactly what to do and they can contribute to winning ways and make winning plays. I don't think any team can replicate that. I don't think any team can match what Miami can do. And, and the argument I keep hearing is, well, there's more talent in Brooklyn. There's more talent in Milwaukee. Yeah, well, at some point that talent gets beaten. And I think you still have very, very talented players in Jimmy and Bam who we haven't seen for most of the regular season and I think are still capable of greatness. And then the fact that you have a, a third great player in Kyle and other great role players that understand and can have huge nights, not just, you know, not just like 10 points here and there, but like 20 points, 30 points on any given night. I mean, that's incredible. That's that level of talent and depth. No team can replicate. This is the deepest heat team I've ever covered. I think this is the deepest team in the league by far. And I think they, they're poised for a championship run. Yeah, and um, I've used this phrase a few times before, and Carl Lowry deserves a lot of the credit for this because yes. without him, I don't think the record looks as good. He's been sensational in marshalling this team. But yep. the biggest compliment I can give every single one of these guys, Max, Carl Geyer, Gabe Vincent, Caleb, all of them, is we're missing two all-stars in Bam and Jimmy, and yet they're making us not miss them. And that's huge. Right. That's huge. And what, what a credit to them. So uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. We'll see what happens, um, you know, Fans are fickle. We're only a short way run from it all being disastrous again. But I'm with you. I'm not touching this team. This team doesn't need to, any moves made to it. Let's just see what happens because we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen it at full strength and it's all clicking at the right time. So uh, let's hope that continues. So what a joyous podcast that was, full of positivity, full of great stuff. <laughs> um, David, always an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, if anybody's mad enough not to know, where can everybody find you and uh, your work at Lockdown? Well, they can just follow us at Locked On Heat. Uh, obviously, we put out daily shows and cover games and any interviews, things of that sort. We can always find it there. And of course, we're growing our YouTube channel. It's still a fledgling channel. We've only had been out for a couple of months, but it's growing steadily. And thanks to everybody's support. So yes, definitely check us out on YouTube uh, or wherever you get podcasts and make sure you subscribe and hit that follow button. Absolutely. Can't say echo that more. He's, uh, he's one of my favorite go-tos. Um, David and Wes, both fantastic. 
great to watch them as well now on YouTube. That's a new venture that I've enjoyed. Um, so please carry on. If you haven't done so, please go and subscribe to their stuff. Um, we will be back next week. We've got a couple of good guests coming up. We've come into uh, 2022 uh, on all, fire, all cylinders fired. We've had a bit of a break. We've not been as active on the pod as I've liked. Work issues. I've got COVID again, as you all know, you know picking up variants like you know anything's business but that's all past us now we're back to full health so we've had david today which has been fantastic next week we've got jeremy tache from valley sports and then the week after that we hopefully got ethan skolnick from five reasons so coming into 2022 in a big way so please subscribe do all the usual things and um we'll uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode until then let's get this heat run going and we'll catch up soon take it easy guys You've been listening to Heating Up the UK. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts to ensure you never miss a show. Also, go give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by finding our page at the Miami Heat UK. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, Miami Heat UK TV, for our latest shows and fun content. That's your Miami Heat from across the pond. Covered. Thanks for listening.